starts right now. The sheriff calls him a monster. That's how the Atascosa County Sheriff describes a man arrested for a double murder. That man is accused of planning his ex-girlfriend's murder weeks in advance and then killing her roommate in the process. Tonight, Camille Juarez tells us how the sheriff's department there believes a house fire in a dumpster helped lead to his arrest. In my opinion, this is the making of a monster and hopefully we stopped it from getting that further. After being taken into custody yesterday, the Atascosa County Sheriff's Office says Rosendo Montoya confessed to the murder of his ex-girlfriend, 33-year-old Mary Hines, and her roommate, 43-year-old Laura West. Soward says Montoya was infatuated with Hines and spent weeks planning the murder. The suspect was basically obsessed with Mary Hines. Investigators believe Montoya broke into their home on Peach Street in Lemming, Texas, just north of Pleasanton. Soward says Montoya then shot West in the head and set the living room on fire last Wednesday. We think he went there to to get Mary Hines. The other lady was collateral damage. When firefighters responded to the fire, they discovered West's body and Hines missing. She was nowhere to be found, which uh, sparked off a uh, uh, a mystery right away with that. Investigators thought Montoya was a suspect and began watching him. Yesterday, while Montoya was working at a restaurant, deputies watched him park his car near a dumpster and toss two trash bags. When my investigators went into the dumpster and retrieved the two black plastic trash bags and found they contained partial human remains. Sheriff Soward would not say what restaurant and whose remains were in the bag. During interviews, the sheriff says Montoya confessed to shooting Hines, but investigators have not released where or when she was killed. Montoya took investigators to the county road where he dumped Hines' body. A case like this one is, is extremely rare. Uh, extremely rare. Sheriff Sauer says that Montoya had no previous arrests. Now the 27 year old is charged with capital murder and he's here at the Atascosa jail on a $1 million bond. Camelia Juarez, case at 12 news. Back here in San Antonio, we now know the name of a five year old boy who was killed in a multi vehicle crash on I 10 yesterday. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office has identified the boy as Tony Tran. He died around 730 last night. The car he was in was rear ended by another vehicle after suddenly stopping. Tran was sitting in the back seat and was ejected from the car. The driver of the car Tran was in was 22 year old Do Ann Khan Tukmai, and she's now charged with manslaughter in his death. Today, search teams recovered the body of a man believed to have fallen off of a boat on Calaveras Lake yesterday. The man's name has not yet been released, but Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar said today he was a 36-year-old Army Staff Sergeant. The victim was fishing with two other men on July 4th when he fell in. His friends tried to save him, but couldn't. We're told the man was in good physical shape, but was not a strong swimmer. A suspected love triangle is what may have spurred a deadly shooting this morning in the Mission Del Lago neighborhood over on the south side. SAPD Chief William McManus says a couple lived at this gray house on Pelican Landing, a man and woman in their late 20s and early 30s. Around 9.30 this morning, another man showed up to the house who the homeowner believed was having an affair with the woman who lived there. They got into an altercation and the man who lived in the home allegedly shot and killed that other man. A neighbor who wanted to remain anonymous was close by when it all happened. I've lived here three years and none of this happened like that. I was kind of surprised. It's not some, someone who, who, a stranger who broke into a house. Uh, there's, no, uh, um, there's no danger to anyone else in the neighborhood right now. Chief McManus would not say uh, if the homeowner had been arrested, but instead said he is currently in custody answering questions from investigators. So far, he has not been charged. San Antonio police are looking for a person involved in a hit and run that killed a man. That man's family now juggling making funeral arrangements and seeking justice in this case. Our Jonathan Cotto spoke to the victim's loved ones who share how they're now remembering him. A family's in shock and disbelief after their loved one, 29-year-old Isai Alvarado, was struck by a car and left for dead. The heart-wrenching incident happened around 3 a.m. on Sunday, June 25th, as Alvarado was crossing the street on the 900 block of San Pedro Avenue. Today, his family holding on to the memories. Alvarado left them. He was definitely somebody who was a big kid at heart, right? Somebody who, although really responsible as an adult, still had a lot of 
uh, the childish part of him that, that took over every day, right? The family now caught between grief and the strong desire for justice. You're dealing with preparing for a funeral and going through all those arrangements, walking the cemetery, right? Picking a plot, picking out a casket, and at the same time in the back of your mind, you can't quite let go of the fact that you still have a whole other aspect of it where you're pursuing somebody who left someone there and didn't quite care for their life enough to stop and assist them. San Antonio police say the person involved in the hit and run was driving a dark colored sedan who made no effort to stop and help Alvarado, but there was a witness, a rideshare driver. He had compassion, he had respect for another human being to stop there, help them make sure they were okay and stay there and speak on what he saw. Compassion and respect is what the family of Isai Alvarado say the driver involved in the hit and run is lacking. Now they're hoping video surveillance footage of that morning was captured by this camera. We know there's a process for everything, but just don't red tape us, right? We, we want to find some closure and be able to figure out what we need to figure out to, to start to put this to rest hopefully soon. Jonathan Cotto, KSET 12 News. Out of San Marcos tonight, the city announcing late this afternoon they have arrested a suspect in that deadly apartment fire from 2018 that killed five people, including one person from San Antonio. They are planning a press conference for tomorrow morning where they will talk about what happened that day at the iconic village. The victim from San Antonio was 20-year-old Drew Estes. We have a Texas Crime Stories podcast about that story which you can listen to right now anywhere you get your podcasts. The body of an eight-year-old boy who fell off a boat in Lake Travis has now been recovered. The Travis County Sheriff's Office told Austin Media that dive teams found the child's body Tuesday night. Emergency services posted on social media that the drowning happened around 2 in the afternoon in the Cow Creek arm of Lake Travis. They also say the child was not wearing a life jacket at the time. Let's take a live look outside with live cam. Plenty of sunshine out there, but cooler temperatures compared to what's headed our way. Yes, exactly. And part of those cooler temperatures, at least this afternoon and now heading into this evening, all thanks to some isolated, even widely separated showers that we've seen. We do still have some of that activity moving across our far eastern counties near Hallettsville, Shiner, stretching over to Gonzales, and even just north of Yorktown. We're pretty quiet here in San Antonio right now, but a few more splashes just off to our southwest. Another little shower there near Honda into Hannes and another little complex moving into the northern portions of the hill country near Rock Springs there as well. Now, whatever's left on the radar does look to die down after sunset, but we have another chance in the works as we head into our Thursday. So we'll get you details on that, plus some warming temperatures headed our direction coming up in just a few guys. All right, we'll see you then. Thanks, Mia. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. This is the camera here. I-10 at Callahan, uh, the westbound lanes. Uh, certainly the ones headed towards 410. That's always the interchange that really backs up this time of day. Looks like that is taking shape once again during the 6 o'clock commute. Other than that, looks like things are moving along just fine. Some good news for San Antonio attorneys who handle indigent defense cases under a plan that went into effect earlier this summer. Lawyers who represent defendants who cannot otherwise afford legal counsel got a significant pay increase. Jim Bethke, executive director of Bear County Managed Assigned Council, says the county ranked dead last in the state for compensation and that a vast majority of attorneys willing to take on these types of cases had stopped doing so. The attorneys that remained on the list, the case, the number of cases that they were getting assigned jumped from like one a week to six to ten, sometimes even eleven. Coming up in just a few minutes, KSAT investigates reveals the behind the scenes dispute that went along with this fee increase and why County Judge Peter Sakai says he was caught off guard by the process. Here's a quick look at what we're working on for you tonight on the night beat. Don't take it for granted. It's what the children of a couple that had been together for decades are saying days after their tragic death, tragic deaths here in San Antonio. That story coming up tonight. And now to the latest on cocaine found in the West Wing of the White House. Agents found it over the weekend while the president and his family were away at Camp David, but it did cause a brief evacuation. ABC's Faith Abube with an update on the investigation into how that cocaine got inside the White House and who brought it there. 
Four days after a white substance found inside the White House sparked a hazmat response, the U.S. Secret Service says new test results confirm the unknown item was in fact cocaine. When it comes to security, when it comes to anything of those types of protocols, that is something that Secret Service handles. Multiple first responders rushed to the White House Sunday after agents found the powdery substance inside the West Wing. The White House temporarily evacuated. ABC News obtaining this radio traffic of D.C. fire and EMS first responders discussing the preliminary test results of the substance. We have a yellow bar stating cocaine, hydrochloride. President Biden, the First Lady and family members, including Hunter Biden, were all seen together Friday leaving Fort McNair on Marine One to celebrate the holiday weekend at Camp David. They were not present when the cocaine was found and the building evacuated. The White House frequently undergoes security sweeps, but it's unclear how long the bag of cocaine had been in the West Wing before agents was reportedly found in an area where some visitors were instructed to leave their phones while visiting the White House. Tours with access to that space typically happen on the weekends, but asked when visitors were most recently in that area, the Secret Service declined to answer. And the agency says those details are pertinent to their investigation as they try to narrow down who had access to the West Wing around the time the cocaine was discovered. It's not yet clear how long it'll take before this investigation is concluded, but the Republican-led House Oversight Committee is requesting a Secret Service briefing on the matter. In Washington, Faith Abube, ABC News. Get ready because as we've started a new month here in July, we have plenty of road work that's going to take us into the early days of August, believe it or not. So let's go ahead and get you started what you can expect along State Highway 151 over on the west side of San Antonio. Construction work. Now, this does begin July 5th, Wednesday, July 5th, that is, and should wrap on Thursday, July 6th. This all starts around 9 in the morning and hopefully will wrap around 3 in the afternoon. But it's during that time we're going to see single lane closures on the frontage road in both directions. That's east and westbound lanes. So be on the lookout there from Ingram Road to Cable Ranch Road. I do want to take a jump over here to I-10 in Kendall County where we have rail repairs. If you travel through I-10, you know that there's plenty of work taking place. This also begins Wednesday, July 5th, but should take us to Friday, July 7th. Work starts again at 9 in the morning and will wrap around 3 in the afternoon, but this does impact the exit ramp to 542 because it will be closed. All right, one more jump here, guys. We have another one in US-281 on the north side of San Antonio. There's concrete and paving work taking Taking place. This also begins on Wednesday, July 5th and should wrap on Friday, July 7th, 9 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon, single northbound lane closure at Mulberry Avenue. But if you scan this QR code, there's plenty of work taking place in and around the Alamo City that takes you directly to our KSAT traffic page. We have a full list of all the closures that are happening in our area, so plan your commute ahead of time. All right, some people lucky enough to see some good rain today. So Mia, for those who didn't especially, wondering if any more is on the way. Yep, we've got one more decent chance in the works tomorrow before high pressure takes back over. And you all know what that means. Rain chances are pretty much out of the forecast starting this weekend, and those temperatures are going to crank back up. So let's take a look. Yes, basically our weather headlines. Tomorrow we've got about a 30 to 40% chance to find a few more isolated to widely separated downpours especially in the afternoon hours because of the moisture in the daytime heat altogether. But then after that, that's when we're going to see that big blue H high pressure work its way back into the Lone Star State, which unfortunately means that those triple digits are going to work back into the forecast as early as this weekend. So more toasty temperatures in the works as well. Let's get you a look at what we're monitoring though right now. We're pretty quiet here in San Antonio after finding some of that isolated shower activity earlier this afternoon. You can see we still do have a few showers that are on a weakening trend as they work their way farther up to the north in our far eastern counties near Hallettsville, Shiner, stretching over to the Gonzales, even Quero, Yorktown areas there as well. Off to our southwest near Catula, south of Carrizo Springs, near Crystal City. Once again, a few more showers that are really on their weakening trend, and that's still the case with that little cluster north of 
Rock Springs up there in Edwards County. We did manage to find a few showers near Hondo and Tehannis, and even over there near Sabinal as well over the past 30 to 45 minutes. Now this has also been a little catalyst behind some of the activity that we've seen today. There's an area of low pressure in the far western portions of the Gulf of Mexico. That's helping slingshot some additional moisture as well as energy into the southern portions of the state of Texas. So we'll still keep that isolated chance for another shower in the forecast generally through sunset this evening. Then I think whatever is still left out there on the radar is going to dissipate and we're pretty quiet through the overnight hours. Here's wake up time Thursday morning around 7 a.m. So morning drive time. Most of us are still pretty dry out there, but I think a stray shower or two not completely out of the question. And then as we head throughout the first half of the day, just a few isolated showers possible. I think the best chance we will have to find some of that shower and maybe isolated storm activity tomorrow is in the peak heating time of day and between about three, five, six o'clock. That's where we'll need to monitor for a little bit more of that activity before once again we allow those rain chances to come down after the sun goes down. Now whatever we can find again, it's not going to be for everybody tomorrow, but whatever we can find certainly does help here in San Antonio this afternoon. Just over a tenth of an inch is what we were able to pick up on officially here in town. We still do have that drought in place, especially across our far northwestern counties. That exceptional drought for places like Bernie stretching over to Kerrville even have some severe drought across the far northern and western portions of Bear County. So we'll definitely see what we can find before the sun goes down tomorrow. All right, let's talk temperatures and that trend that we're expecting into the weekend. Right now we're in the 90s for most of us. 99 in Carrizo Springs, 91 here in San Antonio, thanks to some of that rain that we were able to find earlier today. There's that high pressure system. Right now it's anchored off to our west, but it's going to slide eastward ever so slightly this weekend, really tightening its grip on our weather pattern, which means yes, those afternoon highs are going to crank back up 96 for your Friday, 99 into Saturday and yes, low 100s as we head into the weekend and next week. But before we can get there, mid to upper 70s, first thing tomorrow morning, 82 by 10 a.m., 86 by lunchtime and then those daytime highs climbing into the low 90s. We've got a forecast high pointed around 93 degrees tomorrow. So really soak it up and hopefully <laughs> more of us will find a few more showers out there tomorrow because after that, it's kind of slim pickings, not a whole lot of rain. Yeah, it looks like it. Thanks, Mia. Our Spurs getting ready right now to face off against the hated oh, Lakers. Yeah. <laughs> About 40 minutes away from tip off in Sacramento. We'll have that for you coming up. Also, Larry Mirrors is there and he goes one on one with one of the shining stars of the summer so far. And San Antonio FC gets a big boost today as they go on the road this weekend. Spurs coming off that pretty impressive win over Charlotte Monday night in Sacramento to tip off their summer league tonight. Just game two, but it is another opportunity for so many of the young Spurs, including free agents. They get that chance to perform for the Spurs and win some playing time or maybe even showcase their talents for other executives that are paying attention. And speaking of paying attention, Larry Ramirez is in California. He's always paying attention. Already got a big crowd behind you there, Larry, ready to go tonight. <laughs> We do have a big crowd, and there's a game going on right now between the Hornets and the Warriors. After this, the Spurs are going to play. So the Spurs are ready for their second and final game here at the California Classic. Then after that, they're going to leave late tonight to fly to Las Vegas to meet up with Wimby. So the Spurs held a voluntary shoot around this morning at the Kings old practice facility just outside of Sacktown. Julian Champagny and the Spurs are looking to build off of their impressive 98-77 win against the Hornets Monday night. Julian dropped a 30 piece in that one. After shoot around, we caught up with Blake Wesley to get his thoughts about facing the Lakers and Julian's great summer league opener. Uh, he was on fire, as y'all can see at 30. So. I was just feeding him the ball, giving him the ball, wherever he needed to get, so he was on fire. How fun is that for you guys when you're playing as well as you were and you you lead a team from start to finish? It's fun. I mean, you've seen, you've seen the score. It was 16-2, to two, so and then we just went on a run from there. We played defense. Uh, everybody did their role. Nobody did too much, so we just got the win. So. I'm proud of you guys for a player like Champagne. He gets a new contract, and then he plays really solid in that first game. Yeah, it's a blessing for him. Uh, that's the definition of anything can happen. Uh, he was undrafted and then he signs a contract for four years. So anything can happen if you put your mind to it and keep working. So that you can see. What do you know about this Lakers team you're playing tonight? I have, I know 
uh, Max Lewis, Jalen Hussefino, but we're worried about ourselves. Uh, we're worried about getting the, getting a win, uh, being ourselves, and then getting a win like we did the other night. So we're not worried about anybody but ourselves. Today, the Spurs announced they signed guard Serge Barry Rice to a two-way contract. He played last season for Texas as a graduate student. Honestly, my dreams just came true in front of me. But uh, honestly, I'm just not wanting to be big on being satisfied, but I'm just very blessed. I thank God for the opportunity, and I'm just excited to get to work. Congratulations to Rice. Spurs will face the Lakers tonight at 7 right here at the Golden 1 Center. Now Rice is not here with the team as he's dealing with some sort of an illness. He is expected to join the Spurs in Las Vegas. David, back to you. All right, Larry, thank you very much. Enjoy the game. San Antonio FC hitting the road for a match against Memphis this week. SAFC is third, five points behind Western Conference leader Sacramento. Over their last four, they are 1-1 with two draws. They are coming off an impressive 3-1 win over Birmingham. They even got a lift today. Shannon Gomez is returning to the team after playing in the Gold Cup for his home country, Trinidad and Tobago. He told us today about that experience. It, it was exciting, you know, for me, for my family to represent the red, white, and black is always a pleasure. Um, and it's an honor. And, you know, I, you know, wear those colors with pride. And, um, you know, just representing on San Antonio FC and my family and friends on the international stage was it was a pleasure and the biggest tournament in our region. As so San Antonio FC's next match, once again, they will be on the road in Memphis Friday night. And that one starts at 730. And of course, tonight on the night beat highlights and post game reaction from the Spurs and Lakers from Larry up there. All right, we'll look forward to that. Thank right. you, David. Mm -hmm. Still to come in our next half hour, several cities hit with deadly gun violence over the July 4th holiday weekend. How leaders in those cities are responding. Coming up. San Antonio attorneys who take on misdemeanor indigent defense cases have reason to celebrate. County court judge uh, county court judges late this spring approved a substantial pay increase for lawyers whose clients cannot otherwise afford legal counsel. But that jump in compensation has come with some controversy. The head of Bear County government, Judge Peter Sakai, tells KSAT Investigates Dylan Collier he was blindsided by the multi-million dollar hit to the budget. In April, inside this hotel near the airport, members of the San Antonio Criminal Defense Lawyers Association were among some of the first people to hear the good news. And we can now announce that we have been approved. So rather than what you're currently being paid. In an order that went into effect May 1st, the county court judges revamped the payment system for attorneys who handle misdemeanor indigent defense, raising the rate from $180 to $300 per case, plus allowing for itemization of certain appearances like initial jail visits. They can also now opt for an hourly rate instead of a flat fee for more complex cases like DWI and family violence. This was a crisis. The new fee schedule is a big win for Jim Bethke. Executive Director of Bear County's Managed Assigned Council. Bear County is last in the state in per capita spending on indigent defense. Equally concerning to proponents of the pay increase, fewer than 70 attorneys in Bear County were willing to take on this kind of work as of this year, meaning they were assigned as many as 11 indigent defense cases a week on top of the workload they were already handling in their private practices. This was something that was direly needed. The Texas Code of Criminal Procedure allows judges to sign off on these sorts of fee schedules without commissioner's court approval. Officials estimate that for misdemeanors alone, the fee increase will cost the county around $30 million over the next five years. Judge Peter Sakai claims he was kept in the dark throughout this whole process. Records show Sakai wasn't made aware of the increase until April 19th, after the county court judges had already approved it, prompting Sakai to call for an immediate assessment of the project. May 1st, in a strongly worded email to Melissa Vara, administrative judge for the misdemeanor courts, Sakai objected to the new fee schedule, telling Judge Vara, quote, the essence of an abuse of discretion is a decision made in a vacuum. Weeks after writing that email, and I've been caught off guard. Sakai was still upset with how the pay hike played out. So who dropped the ball here? 
Well, I don't know who dropped the ball. All I will tell you is that I've got to deal with a fee increase, a budgetary increase, and I've got to figure out how to pay for it. Judge Vara pushed back on the criticism, providing KSAT timestamps showing Sakai's executive assistant was twice contacted by email about setting up a meeting with Sakai to discuss the proposal and was sent a third email with the fee schedule attached alerting Sakai's office to the upcoming vote. It's been a very enjoyable year. Bethke, who alluded to overhauling indigent defense pay during the January 24th commissioner's court meeting, confirms a formal presentation he was scheduled to make to the court six weeks later did not take place. I, I think communications probably could have been better. I know going forward on something like that, I know and I've shared with the budget people, I'm going to do a better job um, of communicating that. For KSAT Investigates, I'm Dylan Collier. Now, because this fee hike took place outside of the budget cycle, county officials will not know the full impact of the financial hit until next fiscal year. Indigent defense increases for felony courts and children's courts also went into effect May 1st, but had already been going up incrementally, so the impact there not as drastic. The former Smallville actress Allison Mack was released from federal prison this week. She was sentenced to three years behind bars in 2021 for her role in the cult-like group Nexium. In 2018, Mack was arrested along with other leaders in that organization, including Keith Rainier, who was sentenced to 120 years in prison for racketeering charges. The cult was based in Albany, New York, and claimed to give life self-help instructions. But prosecutors say members were forced into sexual abuse with the group's leader. Also in New York, former Democratic Representative Mondaire Jones has announced a comeback bid for Congress. He's running for New York's 17th district, the seat he previously held. <clears throat> in 2020, Jones became one of the first openly gay black men elected to Congress. He was seen as a rising star in his party before choosing not to run for re-election in the 17th district. Instead, he chose to run for the Manhattan-based 10th district, but lost in the primary. Democrats ended up losing the 17th district to Republican Representative Mike Lawler. Officials ramping up patrols on New York's Long Island beaches following a string of possible shark attacks. In just two days, four people were, were reportedly bitten. On July 4th, two attacks minutes apart. Then on Monday, two 15-year-olds were bitten in separate incidents. One shark expert says Long Island has a large sand tiger shark population, and these attacks could be caused by juvenile sharks mistaking people for prey. If visibility is low and there's lots of people in the water, accidents can happen. It's not just New York that's had recent shark sightings either. In Florida, swimmers were stunned when a shark was spotted swimming in shallow waters there. Gun violence ruptured what was supposed to be a peaceful long weekend of celebration from a 4th of July block party in Louisiana to what authorities say was an armored gunman in Philadelphia seemingly shooting victims at random. In the aftermath, there is anguish across America tonight and renewed calls for action. Mike Valerio takes us through what happened and the visceral reactions to the violence. Amid celebrations of freedom, a sense of inescapable violence, mass shootings marring the long 4th of July weekend across America. In the birthplace of American democracy, Philadelphia, five are dead after police say a gunman wearing a bulletproof vest carrying a device that tracks first responders radio communications opened fire with an assault weapon, shooting seemingly random victims. Point of fact is a person like that walking down a city street with an AR-15 and shooting randomly at people is a disgraceful situation in the United States of America, whether it's July 4th or any other day. Philly's district attorney not holding back about the state's gun laws. Pennsylvania's gun regulation is crap. It is crap. If you go to New Jersey, if you go to other states nearby, you go to Delaware, these states are safer and they are states that have more reasonable gun regulation. The scenes are spread across the country, from nine injured in Washington, D.C., to at least 10 people shot in Shreveport, Louisiana. Four of the Shreveport victims are dead, killed at a July 4th block party. At this point, what I am looking for is justice. In Tampa, police say an argument over jet skis led to senseless gunfire, a stray bullet killing a seven-year-old boy. There was no reason, no excuse, 
that an argument can lead to gunfire, much less an argument over jet skis. I'm Mike Valerio reporting. Cognitive decline is not inevitable as you age. And in fact, there are things you can do to maintain your brain health as you age. AARP released a report stating what you can do to keep your brain healthy the older you get. We'll share some of the tips that will keep you sharp as a tack when we return. Plus, you might have heard about a connection between clean teeth and heart health. What scientists have recently discovered after the break. 